Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, so welcome back. So we'll continue on corner error correction today. Uh, but I want to remind you that homework three is due Sunday. And homework four uh, is already available. And it's on Qiskit using teleportation. It's a uh, guided uh, coding. So you can download the code and and work on that and and submit your code. And I also want to uh, mention that for those graded homework, uh, if you submit the PDF appropriately, then I can directly annotate uh, your homework directly and you should see the annotations. So I would encourage you to submit using a PDF. If you scan the picture, if you can convert to PDF, it uh, would be useful. Um, I hope uh, you could try to see the, the homework, the graded homework. Okay. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to review a little bit of what we talked about last time on error correction, then move on to more of the topics in corner error correction. Yeah, so the first thing to review is Shor's nine qubit error correction code. Uh, there is a notation that's often used using NKD and a double bracket. N is the number of physical qubit, nine qubit. Uh, let me just show the code. One is you only encode one logical qubit, logical zero and one with arbitrary superposition. Three is the so-called code distance. Basically, uh, two times the number of correcting so two times number of correctable qubit plus one need to be greater than the code distance, which is three in this case. And so you have one correctable qubit. What that means is if there is an error on any of the nine qubit, then you can correct that. If you have two or more error, then you cannot correct uh, those errors. But we are assuming that one qubit error occur with small probability. Okay, so the content of Shaw's error correcting code is using the bit flip code and also the face flip code and then combining them, right? So face flip, uh, sorry, face flip code is, uh, you have minus sign added to the one. So using the dual basis, the plus can actually correct uh, against the face error, okay, but sure, uh, combine the, the two so that you can actually correct the bit flip. For example, using these zero one, you can correct the bit flip as we talk about that. And then because it's also using the advantage of the phase flip code, uh, it can also be used to detect the, the phase errors. Because for example, if there's a phase flip here, then this will turn this to a minus sign. So minus sign is effectively a encoded minus. So you can you can you can actually check the face. Yeah. To see if it's here. So that's the idea of short error correction code. And I mentioned that it can correct one qubit errors. So uh, we are going to talk about how we can see this. Yes, yeah, sorry. questions. Uh, sorry, uh, so you said two times the number of correctable qubits plus one 
must be larger than or equal to the code distance? No, no, it should be smaller. Yeah, okay. the other way around. Yeah, let me see if I can erase this. Okay, it should be. Hold on a minute. Um, yeah, so I think I pen. Uh, okay, yeah, it's working now. Should be able to erase this. Yeah. So you want the distance to be as far as possible. Yeah. Okay. So, and we also talk about uh, errors in general. So it can be regarded as a operation, a unitary operation on the combined system and environment. So this is a system, this is the environment. And we assume the environment uh, is in a pure state, but there was a question asked last time. It's, it's actually not necessary, but it's a convenient way to do that. Uh, but you could also justify using a pure state. Uh, if you trace out part of the environment, that could be a, like a fictitious part. When you trace out that, it becomes a mixed state in the sense that you can if the environment were in a mixed state, you can purify by adding a, a, dish, a fictitious part and then tracing over that fictitious part, you get that desired mixed state. Okay, if you don't get this, it's not that important. The upshot is that you can, you can assume it's, it's pure state to begin with. And we want the error to act on the system. And then there is additional uh, change of the environment. So general unitary on the combined system can always be written this way. Okay. So now I think about this is because the EK acting on the system alone. So you can treat that as an error and you can ask how to correct that. But there are also property of these EK. So if we consider the, the overlap, it should be preserved under the unitary evolution. And if I insert these uniqueness, sorry, the decompositional identity on, on the environment part, right? So this EK is sort of taking this piece. So I, do not explicitly define EK, but let me define it here. Okay. This U acts on psi and E0. So if you're only removing the degree of freedom in environment, so this is an operator. Um, Sorry, okay. And because this should hold for any pair of the system state, so that means uh, the EK, these error satisfy the condition. You take the conjugate of that, multiply itself, sum over all possible error should be identity. This means trace preserving, okay. So yeah, for a general mixed state, if we regard the, the system initially not in a pure state side, but in a mixed state, how, how does it evolve? Right? So we know for a pure state, pure state, this is how it evolves, a pure state. But actually from here, if we trace out environment. This actually imply that initial psi actually is 
taking to ek psi and ek dagger. Okay, so let me make it slightly bigger. Okay, so it is taking, if you regard this as a mixed state of a pure state, so it's a density metric of a pure state, it goes from row to row, but sandwiched in between by these E and E dagger and summing all the K. Okay, so from that you can generalize to any mixed state row. Okay because rho can be decomposed into mixture of pure state, which we talked about earlier in the earlier lecture. Okay. Yeah. So that's the two slide review of what we talked about last time. Any questions? Okay, so if not, then we can look at a few examples of these EK. See, so far it looks abstract. So EK, these are the error, possible error. One kind of error, bit flip, we talk about, right? We also talk about face uh, flip. So there is an error, this is an error model of bit flip. Row goes from itself to a par which does not change. And this is the probability. Remain in row, okay. And this is the probability that flip. So X basically is the, that, that operator. So this is an error and this is not an error. It just remain the same. So there's a way that we can see on the blocks of here, how, how the action of this. So initially uh, you have the blocks of here. Under this, it actually shrink in a way that uh, preserving the length in the x direction. We should say maximal length in x like this. So become like a football shape. Okay, and you can see this easily. Uh, if you remember, we have row can be written as this, right? And now row goes to one minus P times row, adding a portion that flip. So in terms of the vector, this is one minus P. So R goes to one minus P times r and a part that flip the the vector. So x row x dagger. So row, if you regard just the sigma x, it doesn't change sigma y, sigma z change sign. Okay. So X itself is sigma X, okay. So you flip RX, sorry, RX is the same, but RY get flipped, RZ get flipped. So the maximal X distance is preserved, but there is a decrease in the Y and Z direction, okay. So this is just a, a nice visualization of what the error does, and I'm using a specific probability. Okay. You could also consider a phase uh, flip error. And sometimes th these 
uh, these uh, are also called channel. So you have a bit flip channel, face flip channel. And basically this is just in a different basis. So the Z direction, it, it's flipped with respect to Z. So preserving this axis and get shrink. So become a football shape vertically. Okay. You could also combine the bit flip with a fade flip. And combining that is basically bit and that's face. So essentially this is Y. Okay. And that meaning that the deformation is preserving the Y axis. Okay. And there are more channels, uh, one that related to these uh, bit and uh, face flip and the Y channel is this depolarizing channel. In the case of one qubit, this is, uh, okay, this is, in the case of general, it says there's a probability, some probability remain in a row, but there's some probability it at really is it called completed mix state. It's proportional to the identity. In the one qubit case, uh, you can verify by yourself using also using this uh, representation. You can verify that identity as can be obtained from such combination. So equivalently, this depolarizing channel has uh, some interpretation, meaning that uh, some probability it remain the same and there are equal probability of X, Y, and Z errors, okay? And in the case of one qubit, the picture of depolarizing channel is just shrinking of the sphere in all three directions uniformly. Okay. So any questions so far on um, the, a few error channels? Okay, if not, let's talk about why and how we understand that Shaw's code can protect all one qubit error. There's a nice quote from Nielsen and Tran. Uh, it says that the apparent continuum of error that may occur on a single qubit can all be corrected by correcting only a discrete subset of those errors. So this can be understand um, in terms of the error, general error EK, we can decompose into, again, poly matrices. So identity X, Y, and Z with some coefficient. These E's are coefficient. So you can then ask the action of this error on a encoded qubit. That would be like this. And this is this here I assume it acts on specific uh, one qubit. So suppose you apply to a one qubit psi, this just act accordingly. But the nice thing is that you can interpret that the effect of that type of error is to make the state in a super superposition of no error or the X error or Y error or Z error. So when you make measurement, make the so-called syndrome measurement. We talk about checking whether there is a bit flip or face uh, flip or the combined. So here is no error. This is bit, this is bit plus face. And here is face. There are distinct errors. So they have distinct syndromes. 
So this thing syndrome. So when you make the syndrome measurement, it would collapse to either of the four components. So for example, you make a syndrome measurement and you find that there is a bit flip error and on one of the qubit, then it would project to that, right? And, and then you simply need to apply the corresponding uh, flip back to the correct state. Let's say if you have a phase flip error and you use the syndrome measurement to extract where the uh, phase flip is, you can apply Z again to undo the phase flip. Okay, so this is the reason why we know Shaw's code can correct bit, can correct phase, and therefore correct bit plus phase, and therefore can correct arbitrary error in this form. Okay, so that's the, the intuition why Shaw's code can protect all one qubit error. Okay, any question? Okay, if not, um, we talk about Shaw's uh, error correcting code and how we identify error, how we correct them. So here is a general view and a schematic diagram of the error correction code encoding part. So you have some messages you attach some ancillary qubit in code. So for example, there's a short error correcting code. This, is, this part is the encoding circuit. These zeros are the ancillary part in this next slide here. Okay, and the message is what you want. And so when you encode and there might be some error, so this is where error can occur in during the process. And you may do some computation and then you, at the end you want to recover. So you can do some recovery uh, by syndrome measurement and, and then correction. At the end, uh, you will also decode. I think there should be, there should be a decoding. So if you want to extract, you should decode. Yeah, so there's a missing decoding here. Okay. And so from Shaw's correction code, we, we know that the error correction code would give you the logical zero and logical one. And these two bases define the code space. And from the code space, they define the projectors. So for example, in Shor's nine cubic code, you define the projectors. They project to the code space. So formally write this. Okay, so this projector is basically projecting to the good subspace. So and people have identified what kind of error can be corrected if you have certain error correction code. So there's a so-called correctable condition. So notice that P is the projection to the code space. Uh, the, and these E's are the errors. Uh, J label the type of error. It could be X, Y, Z. Z, etc. And this is a error I's conjugation. So the correctable condition says that if you multiply these two error actions and then project to the code space, it's proportional to the projector. If this happens, then these error can be corrected. So this condition basically show that when you make errors and you project to the, the cold subspace, it's as if you cannot tell the difference 
um, but to be more precisely, uh, you could actually diagonalize. So these alpha and beta are some Hermitian matrix, just some coefficient, uh, depending, even though this depends on error, the overall thing does not depends on error. It returns the projector itself. So if you diagonalize the Hermitian matrix and write in terms of the eigenvalue and eigenvectors, you can always diagonalize the Hermitian matrix. If you want, this would be U D U dagger. If you diagonalize that and you can rewrite this correctable condition in a new basis because this U here define a basis transformation. Basically it just re summing the E error into the F and define a new error uh, actions. And this, this probably is a more clear uh, condition. It says when you compute their sort of their adjoint actions, so action FL and then the adjoint FK projected back to the cold subspace, it's diagonal. So meaning that they are orthogonal. So this means the error errors take uh, the cold space to orthogonal subspaces. So maybe the, the intuitive picture is this. This is the cold space. Imagine I'm in some really high dimensional Hilbert space. And there's an error label, maybe this label A1 or A1 may be labeling the subspace. It take some error take to this region, another error to take that region. If the code is designed such that these subspaces are well separated, then these error can be corrected, okay? So that's the meaning of this. So whether it can be correct, it depends on on the code design, right? This is the first ingredient. You need to have a good design of codes and also depend on the error, the set of error. So it's not possible to have a code that can protect against any error, but only a subset of error. Okay, any question on this? this point. Okay, if not, uh, we can maybe put this into action and checking Shor's code, try to understand that. So this is actually an exercise from the book of Nielsen and Trump. So this says explicitly verify the quantum error correction condition for the short call for the error set containing, containing identity and the error operator, X, Y, Z, okay? So I won't do it uh, completely, but I will just sketch to you how, how it goes. So these are the, the calls and define the call subspace P, right? So you have these P, and these E can be X, Y, and Z, or the identity. And these J subscript representing which qubit. Okay, so this is a, so you have, you have many options. So if we just restrict to these error part, so you have X1 to X9 and Y1 to Y9 and Z1 to Z9. 
So there are 27 and also the other 27 combinations that you have to check. Yeah, so I check one. I check one example here, x1, x2. So we have to take the dagger, but these x are Hermitian, so, so it's still x. And here uh, I have under, underlined to representing these these logical. So in fact, so this this is this. That is this. Okay. So you can you can do these calculations. And I find that uh, these are diagonals for the x. And so therefore for this part it satisfies that this is it does not so it returned the most important thing is return the projector itself and these are arbitrary coefficient and for this it happened to be in diagonal. Okay, so you can check other part that you can verify that uh, the error correctable condition holds. Okay, so maybe I could design a homework for you to check uh, other example. I won't ask you to check through all the 27 by 27 cases, but just maybe some of them. Okay, I'll just remind myself. Okay. So this this is a, a second way. So this is actually a second way to understand why Shor's algorithm can correct one qubit error. So we talk about previously we use uh, the superposition of the errors right, in terms of expansion in terms of these poly matrices, and we understand how it can correct one qubit error. Okay, there's actually a third way that we can use to understand why Shor's uh, code can correct all one qubit error. So this is using, in terms of so-called stabilizer, what, uh, what do I mean by stabilizer? We mentioned this last time, basically a stabilizer S, let's see if I use uh, the condition. Okay, I use G. Stabilizer meaning that you have a operator acting on the state, a cell return a cell, this is called stabilizer. Um, a, re all, a requirement is that all these G's should commute. So meaning that they form a, a group, it's called abelian group, those elements they commute is called abelian group. So yeah, now we have to use some uh, group theory uh, language or background. But uh, we can first define a group, which is called polygroup. Polygroup is, might have, okay, polygroup are X, Y, Z. You have many qubits, so you could have many of these, part of, of all these, and you, you could also have plus one, plus i, minus i. So anything that's uh, multiplied by product of poly operator, they call poly group. So I mean, you just write this as product of all possible poly operator. that define the polygroup, okay? And stabilizer group is a subgroup. There's a subgroup. Oh, polygroup. Okay, polygroup is defined as GN. And here basically is the number of qubits. Okay, such that you take the group element apply to the state itself, it return itself. That's called stabilizer group. And so I list the example of the stabilizer 
group element here. So for example, from the, for example, let's take the three, Z1, Z2, you apply to this because they're all plus one, uh, minus one, minus one is plus one. So Z1, Z2 acting on logical zero or logical one return to logical zero or one respectively. Uh, similarly, you can check that Z2, Z3, all these apply to this code does not change. And also these uh, from the checking the phase uh, flip error, this group X1, X2, X3, acting on these return the cell. If there is a phase flip here, you will see that this multiply to that and it will return not a cell but a minus sign, okay? So the stabilizer are useful also in terms of checking the syndrome as we've seen before, okay? So uh, one consequence of the stab stabilizer formalism is that the number of encoded qubit is the total number of qubit you use, total number of physical qubit minus the number of generator in this stabilizer group. So we see that uh, Shor's call the nine qubit to uh, use to encode, and there are eight uh, stabilizer generator. So by generator, I mean the independent one. So you cannot take any of these being product of many of the other. So we want to find a minimum subset. So one equal to minus, a nine minus a, so that, that's the, how we understand the encoding in terms of the stabilizer formalism. Okay, so I would say if uh, this is a slightly advanced topic uh, from the previous proof viewpoint because we use some group theory. Yeah, so I mentioned this already. So this is a uh, one qubit polygroup Two qubit polygroup basically is you take product of possible poly operator and you could also have a plus one minus one coefficient. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I already mentioned this. Okay. So maybe the picture is that if I have a stabilizer generator, if I have this condition, this basically, this is plus one, right? In general, it could be minus one. So the reason that it's assigned to be plus, so it's split cubic space by two, by two cubic space size, which is by two. So meaning that I have two to the n. If I know it's in a plus sign in, on this side, then I'm selecting it to be here. If I have another operator tell me that it's the plus sign here, now the minus sign here, I, I really subdivided that. So nine qubit, the Hilbert space is two to the nine. I have a stabilizer, I have two to the eight constraint and I'm left with two to the one subspace, which is one qubit, okay? Okay, so yeah, so this basically says that, so that's a proposition, uh, G, G1 up to G n minus K are the generator of the group that gener generate this stabilizer group. And we know they need to be commuting with each other. Okay. And okay, so there's a requirement minus one cannot be in S, right? The reason minus one, if minus one were in that, that means I put a minus one times the state itself equal to the plus one. So that means Psi is zero, right? So we have to put this extra constraint, a minus one cannot be in, in a stabilizer, okay? 
then ds, the subspace is to the k dimensional vector space. As I said, it's n qubit over the two to the n minus k is the number of generator. Okay, and that gives you the two to the k dimensional Hilbert space. That means effectively it can encode k qubit. Okay. Yeah, so this vector space Vs is a k qubit cold space. Usually when we denote the cold space, we use C. And that's defined by the stabilizer group. Okay. And uh, yeah, so in this, you can choose two subset of K operator. Basically, we know they are K qubit, right? K qubit, and therefore we should be able to choose K logical operator, K Z operator, and K X operator. And you can show that you can, you can indeed make this. And so that um, adding the Z, the Z logical Z operator, I mean, it could, because K qubit, you could be logical uh, Z1, logical Z2, etc., up to logical ZK. Uh, they should commute with the stabilizer generator. They are independent and they commute. So they, these are mutually commuting. And the X operator should also commute with the stabilizer generator. And then these would need to be anti-commuting. The qubit Z and X, they should be anti-commuting, right? But if the qubit one and qubit two X, they still commute. Let me just say Z1, X1 minus equal to minus X1, Z1. But Z1, X2, they commute. Okay, this is different from the fermion operator. Okay. Okay. So the this basically is a theory uh, proposition that says that if you if you look at the stabilizer homomorphism, it's a guarantee that you can find logical operator X and Z. So that's it. So if you, uh, we, we are not proving anything here, but we will give you an example of shores. So we have the eight, remember we have the eight uh, stabilizer generator. Uh, this did a few slides before, but we can all add, we can always add one logical Z into this point one here. And this logical Z is turned out to be this. Yeah, strangely, uh, I mean, I, I, you, this is in the X1, X2, X3, X product of these X operator. And the logical X is product of Z. Uh, it's just a choice. I mean, you could choose the other way around, okay. So, yeah, so this is a summary of that. So basically this, these two, the first point define, uh, you need to define the, the zero state, all zero, zero state. And the second just says that the logical operator should commute with a stabilizer generator and logical qubits should anti-commute for uh, the same qubit. So Z and X on the same qubit should anti-commute. Okay, I know there's a, it's a, there's a lot of, of group theory uh, here, but it's really straightforward if you think in terms of a specific example of Shor's error correcting code. Right, so let me just remind you, we have a stabilizer generator and the logical Z operator is, is this part of X. The reason is that because we define the Z, uh, the logical zero to be this state, logical one to be this state, we want to define our logical Z, logical Z 
so that logical z acting on logical zero is plus sign. Okay, and logical z acting on one is minus, sorry, this is zero here, it should be minus sign, right? So that's why we choose all part of x to be this, because all part of x, uh, yeah, it would satisfy this condition, z, uh, zero map to zero, but one map to a minus sign because three X on here, there's an additional minus sign here, minus sign there, minus sign. And we want also logical X operator flip between the two. And you can check that's indeed the case because the part of Z at face and there are number here so we would we'll, we'll have a minus sign here if we use z there'll be minus sign everywhere that's so that basically flip this so this is product of z okay so it may it may look weird that z operator logical z is a part of x operator but this is because we already fixed the zero okay any question? Okay, so we talk about the, these uh, stabilizer formalism. It's useful in the sense that it can also be used to explain why Scholl's algorithm can correct one qubit error. So I need to introduce that um, more events condition. So this uh, error correction condition for stabilizer group. Okay, so this is also a theorem in the, from, from the book Nielsen and Tron. It's error correction condition for stabilizer code. So it's formalism. Okay, so S be a stabilizer for uh, stabilizer code just like the here so with these a operator we define will generate the stabilizer group okay group s okay suppose we have such a group and we can define the code such space and suppose we also have error that we, uh, assuming these are error in the poly group, these like x1, x2, x9, or z, any of these uh, action, or could be y1 up to y9, being the possible 27 errors. So how do we know that uh, the error correction code can correct these errors is the condition is such that you take this we have seen these these are uh, appearing from the from the error correctable condition right this like this you remember that so the condition is that if this combination is not in some set uh, minus the S itself, I would define N S for all the possible combination of the errors. Then E J, the set of Z J is correctable. Okay. Uh, in fact, this condition, this theorem is derived, can be derived from this. From this condition. But since we use uh, group theory, so it's, so it's in some sense uh, require a bit knowledge. Okay, so I have not defined the NS. NS is the so-called normalizer group. So what that means is that so what that means is that the normalizer group contain elements E in the polygroup such that it preserve 
S, meaning if you apply E to any of the group element G in the stabilizer in this in this way, this transformation, it still remain in the stabilizer. So that preserve the, the set. So meaning that uh, and S E acting on stabilizer is still stabilizer. Okay. But since uh, all the poly group they are commuting or anti-commuting. So this the so-called normalized group is equal to the so-called centralizer group. Uh, yeah, I hate to introduce more definition, but this is the group that commute with all the elements. So basically this condition basically says um, you want to find a group which commute with all the elements in S. Okay. So maybe it's easier to see an example. I know this, this, uh, there's a lot of group theory, but these are really basic group theory definitions. We only use almost the definition. So you can check. So that, that just maybe said in a simpler words, what is the set of NS? So a set of NS are those elements that commute with the, the stabilizer group. So again, this is the generator of the stabilizer group, right? If we can, if we can find element that commute with all these A, then it commute as the group itself. So the two logical operator definitely commute with uh, the stabilizer group by definitions. But what are other other uh, element that group? element in a poly that also commute with this set. So you can you can check X1, X2, F3 commute with one to eight because if you take X1, X2, F3, X commute, so you don't need to consider the X case. X1, X2, X3 contain X1, X2 that commute with even number of Z poly. Regarding the Z2, Z3, there are two Zs. So two X here, so they also commute. And this does not contain X, uh, Z4, uh, X4, X5, so it commute. So you can check basically it's a product of three X or Z in this order, X1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, et cetera or the Z is one, four, seven, two, five, eight, et cetera. So you can check they commute. Commute with S, okay. So of course, uh, yeah. So the NS would contain the S itself and you removing the S from that set, you're left with these product of three, right? And so the combination E dagger J E K, they are single qubit. So you can only contain, contain at most two poly operator. Right, therefore, is so this this set. Let me just say R the set of these elements are not in N S minus S. Okay. Any questions so far? I know this is this require a lot of 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 uh, group theory uh, to to understand this. If you don't have the background, I'm introducing this as new information, so it may not be easy to process the first time.
So any questions? But try to understand using the example of, of Shaw's error correcting code. Okay. So maybe I can summarize. We have three way, three different way. to understand short error correction code. Right, so why it correct go one qubit error. So the first is we check the EK and this EK one uh, zero identity, EK one X, EK two X Z, EK three Z. We decompose general error in terms of these poly error, and we know the poly error can be corrected. X and Z, therefore X Z identity is no error. That's the first. We're understanding that the second way is using these error correction condition. Uh, P is the code projector, E, I, E, J are the errors. And in terms of stabilizer code uh, shows one of them. The stabilizer are shown on the here from one to H. It's that e, e i dagger e j is not in the normalizer minus the s. So uh, the third wage is a bit advanced, but actually it allow uh, generalizations. So let me pause to see if you have any question. Maybe I check the chat. Uh, is the stabilizer group here the intersection of stabilizer of all basis element in co uh, subspace? Uh, yeah, the question is a bit strange. Stab stabilizer group is a group, so group elements, uh, and then you said the basis element in co space. That that so doesn't make sense. Um, e s equal to n s. Uh, I don't think I write that. So did I write something differently? Yeah, he said he meant he meant uh, centralizer. Centralizer is called is usually denoted as a Z. Uh, centralizer maybe in German it start with Z, so they so, yeah, so they use yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if you can understand at least the first two way of Shaw's code, then we'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned that the stabilizer formalism allow us to generalize more. One of the, I think, very interesting finding is that the smallest number of error correcting code using the smallest number of qubit to encode a logical qubit is five. So the, this is the five qubit code. Um, the detail of here may, may be hard to understand why it's of this form, but you can actually understand using the stabilizer. So you can check all these G1 to G4, these are the stabilizer element. They all commute, you can check they commute. So for example, X1 commute with I, I Z anti-commute. Then maybe let me just draw a line when it's anti-commute. Uh, ZZ commute. X, Z, anti-commute, so you have anti two anti-commuting pairs, so that meaning that they commute. So we can also compare with, for example, here, anti-commute, anti-commute, and therefore they, these two elements commute. 
okay? And using the formula that we just said, once you have these four, as five qubit, right? And you have four generator. So that means this encode one qubit, right? And from uh, one of the slide, it shows that can find logical Z and X operator. The requirement is that these two should also commute, commute with them, but they anti-commute, right? So these two anti-commute. Okay. You can check that these are all satisfied. Okay. So this, this illustrate the stabilizer formula. Maybe it would be useful if I go back a little bit. So I'm showing this. I'm checking the condition that we have in, in here, one of the slide that's very dry. Yeah, this is the this is the slide I was referring to. You have the stabilizer group defined, then you can always find, uh, okay, first you count how many qubit are encoded. So we find k equal to one in that five qubit code. And therefore we can find a logical Z and X operator. They both commute with the stabilizer group and, but they anti-commute among themselves. Uh, if they are on more than one qubit, different X and different Z, they commute. Okay, and that's example for the shore. And let me go back to the five qubit code. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, I'm using the material from New and Tron that the book contain one big chapter of error correcting code error kind of error correction. I'm only discussing really uh, a small part of that chapter. Uh, I'm selecting material which I think are uh, most important uh, if you want uh, and most basic from that chapter. But, but I would say that stabilizer formalism, it perhaps is a new new perspective. But you can also see that in the stabilizer formalism, once you have these G1 to G4 and then Z operator, it uniquely determine the logical Z, so the logical operator Z, zero L and one L. So you uniquely determine Okay. So meaning that if you have the information of these five operator, you don't need to, you don't even need to write down the detail of these, but you could check. So you could check that the Z, five Z's applying on logical zero should be uh, returning plus one. And which is indeed the case you can check because there are only even number of one. So it should be returning to plus one. And for the logical one, it com contains an uh, element that had R number of one. So therefore it should give you a minus sign when you apply the Z operator. And the X logical operator is part of phi X operator, meaning that these are, have correspondent zero, zero, phi zero get flipped to phi one. And that should be the sort of the complement in the binary sense. So you have an uh, element corresponding to each other. Okay. But this is, I think the important thing of this code is the smallest error correcting code. So if you have a five qubit machine, you can encode a uh, one logical qubit 
and that sh uh, if the error rate is small enough, then we should be able to preserve the point information. Okay. The next one, uh, a famous one, is called the Steam Code. Uh, as I said, the seven qubit. One is logical one qubit. Three is the code distance. And you see the detail of these may be hard to understand why we get this, but if you check, you could check uh, the stabilizer. You can check that they all commute. These all commute. And you apply to these logical zero. It should return to a cell, logical one, return to a cell. But the property of stabilizer. And you can buy that uh, slide that I referred back to. You can find logical X and Z. You can check that this really is such a Z acting on logical zero. It's plus one, Z acting on logical one, give you a minus sign. You can check that. Yeah, so, but maybe if you really want to ask, how do I write down the, these uh, components? Okay, so I can give you a few way that you want to do, you can do that. One is you use projectors. So because, um, because you see there are six generator plus one logical Z, it's already saturating the seven qubit, right? So that means these seven operator uniquely determine the state, which is the logical zero. And then you can actually apply the projection. This is projection. Projection to plus one eigenspace as, as I as I said uh, the pictorially I cut one operator giving you plus one and then from here I want to cut maybe let me just say sg1 is plus one and I cut I want to have g2 to be plus one uh, I subdivide it etc etc and I find that's a unique state after I do uh, A dividing, after H half division, okay. And that, that in a sense is implementing that and you only need to take a, a reference state that's not orthogonal to the, the logical zero, then you can get that. And once you get logical zero, you can apply the logical X to flip that. So maybe this also is a bit cryptic. Um, you can see the example of zero, zero plus one, one. They are stabilizer generator of XX. Uh, so they are stabilized by the X and ZZ. But you can see that if I take these combination applied to a reference zero zero I I would obtain that so I can let you verify yourself so that's one way to do that if you really want to write down these but at the moment I say you don't need to do that because that's implicit by these uh, generator okay but there's a more efficient way uh, actually this is a very important aspect uh, um, proposed by Cleve and Gottesman is that they use a, a circuit base. So given that uh, these, you have these generator, how do I, how do I encode? So basically they provide encoding circuit, right? If I start with the logical uh, zero, I, I want a logical zero, how do I encode using the Look at that's that's a way to generate generate these. That's the circuit to generate these 
place this thing. Okay. So any questions so far? So the next topic is maybe for uh, those who have a computer science background um, that you have some experience in classical codes. So I want to mention that. So the seven qubit steam code has really peculiar property that if you look at these uh, stabilizer generator, there are six of them, but they are separate into the X par and Z par. So they don't have any mixed X and Z. If you take one of them, let's say uh, the X block, and if it's identity, you write a zero. If it's X, you write a one, you see that there is a, a matrix like this. And this is a so-called parity check matrix for a classical code. And you can define something called dual code, which has a generator matrix being the, the transport of this. Okay, if you don't have the classical background, that's fine. This is only for the for those who, who know a little bit of the classical code, mainly from computer science. Yeah, so what do I mean by the parity check? Parity check basically mean that if you have a code, for example, the code may, may maybe is showing me that this is one zero zero one one. Uh, that comes from a generator matrix, which has four uh, entries in a row. So that maybe that this can encode four qubit. For example, there are sixteen. Sorry four bits and that's it's a classical code you apply this to okay this i should write in the column uh, for each of these you can get a a code uh, that for example one of the column is a code Par a parity check matrix basically when it apply that it count the parity according to this and if it's zero that means it's a valid code Okay. And for each code, there is also a dual code. So, but let me just say that the Steam code and also more general code, the uh, Kaltenberg uh, Shore Steam or CSS code is generated from a code or, or a code, uh, another code, which is uh, in this case is a dual to that. Is really basically taking uh, a code C2 in this example is the, the dual code run through all the code, code words in C1 okay so maybe that's a, a bit uh, mysterious but let me uh, just illustrate in this way you can understand why we have all these so we run through uh, code uh, C1, which actually have eight elements. And these eight elements are obtained from, from these. So you have 0, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. You can identify the 1, 0, 1, 0 is obtained from, from here. And you have you have zero one one zero zero one one here. So if you take any combination, you add any of the two row, it generate a, a code word. These are the a possibility, right? Because you have three rows, you can take uh, any of the the row. So you have two to the three possibility. They are a possibility, and that actually encode all the possibility into the logical zero states. The logical one basically is a, a, a flip from that, from all zero to all one. So what I said is that if you set this to be zero and you run through all the code words here, that give you one of the logical zero. If you set this to be, for example, 
0111 and run through these code, you get you get logical one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the addition here is bitwise. Yeah, bitwise addition. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a, a advanced topic for those who know uh, classical code. Yeah. But this also give you another way of understanding why you have these combinations. Okay, so in in a sense, we are I'm giving you different results. Try to understand maybe how you get these component, why we have the stabilizer, how the stabilizer can be useful. So that's I think that's the the power of using stabilizer formalism. And I want to mention the, the classical code is also a useful resource to construct many quantum error correction codes. So, so we, we have a lot of, of things that um, exploits the knowledge, of, the knowledge of the classical code, linear code mostly. Yeah. I want to pause here to see if you have any questions. Okay, um, maybe we have a few moments. I, I just want to mention um, other error that can occur in physical reality. So for example, you have an atom in the excited state, it can decay into the ground state. Okay, uh, this was not uh, contained in the Pauli error. This, for example, this is called amplitude damping. So it describes excited state that dropping to the ground state that's described by this 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 operator okay so and the gamma parameter is the strength of the decay and as i said you can write the transformation uh, or the row undergoing the channel being this way and you can you can basically take how the uh, uh the the two by two uh, density metric, how it transforms. Okay. Yeah, I don't have uh, the picture. I think there's a nice picture from New Centron. Maybe I could, I could show that next time. Uh, what I want to mention is that previously we were limiting our cell, uh, even though it's general, but it's only to the poly error. So to claim that your error correction call can correct this type of amplitude damping error. Uh, you have to verify that by the encoding you can reduce the, the error rate and indeed it can show that it reduced from the strain from a gamma to gamma square so if gamma is small enough gamma square will be even smaller so there is a useful quantity called fidelity that you can you can use to show that but i don't want to go to the detail just to define that you have a code word or code state uh, after applying the error channel. This is the error channel. Maybe I should write this as an error channel. And then you compare how close that to the original state. This F define the fidelity. So it was showing that the fidelity can go from this to, to that. I think maybe this to a square. Okay. Okay. There's also another uh, called uh, phase damping. It's related to uh, decoherence. So I mentioned the decoherence is the off diagonal element. There is a reduction. So I mentioned that earlier in 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 the qubit uh, blocks of fear lecture, I guess. Yeah, so these can also be analyzed in a, in a similar way. Okay, so I think I've used up the time, so I want to uh, pause to see if you have any question. Okay, if not, let me remind you the homework is due soon and I'm going to pause the, the midterm report, uh, the questions on the blackboard 
and and then you can start working on that. It's basically an opportunity for you to reflect how you are doing in this course, and also your feedback would help me uh, for the remaining of the lectures. Okay, so if there's no question, uh, let's end the lecture here. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.